S-232. Resuming the debate, Senator Cork. Honorable colleagues, as we celebrate the early days of spring here in the traditional and unceded lands of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people, a time of renewal and hope, I rise today to speak in support of Bill S-232, sponsored by our colleague, Senator Gwen Boniface. Bill S-232 a bill about, is, in fact, a, a bill about renewal and hope. Renewal in terms of how our society approaches illegal substances, the people who use them, and the systems that surround them. And hope that we can look with clear eyes and open minds at the abundance of evidence that exists to guide us through this important moment of necessary change. Senator Boniface reminded us in her speech, and I quote, this bill does two things. Firstly, it mandates conversations between the federal government, the provinces and territories, and other stakeholders so that the federal government can report to Parliament with a national strategy as to how to best tackle the epidemic of substance use. The second thing it does is remove criminal, criminal sanctions from the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act for simple possession, also known as decriminalization. End of quote. The bill's short title, The Health Centered Approach to Substance Use Act, signals the shift in approach. Our colleagues, Senators Pate, Campbell, White, Busson, Dean, and Revalia have weighed in with important perspectives from their frontline experiences in support of this bill and Senator Boniface's previous one, Bill S-229. My intention today is to add to the debate by speaking first to the broader issues of substance use and substance use health, then touch on the limitations and adverse effects of criminalization, otherwise known as prohibition, highlighting recommendations from studies from over the past 50 years, bringing forward voices from uh, last week's United Nations Commission on Narcotic Drugs held in Vienna, and end by encouraging us to get this important and long overdue bill to committee for the in-depth study that it deserves. Honorable colleagues, Dr. Marc-Antoine Koch, in his article, Historical and Cultural Aspects of Man's Relationship with Addictive Drugs, indicates, and I quote, our taste for addictive psychoactive substances is attested to in the earliest human records. Historically, psychoactive substances have been used by priests in religious ceremonies, healers for medicinal purposes, or the general population in a socially approved way. Pathological use was described as early as classical antiquity. He points out that in Shakespeare's play Othello, we get two different takes on substance use, with Cassio declaring, O oh, thou invisible spirit of wine, if thou hast no name to be known by, let us call thee devil. <laughs> and then Iago's, come, come, good wine, is a good familiar creature, if it be well used. Colleagues, CAPSA, the Canadian Addiction Peer Support Association, in its document, Understanding Substance Use Health, a Matter of Equity, points out that the term substance use is often incorrectly used as a synonym for addiction or substance use disorder. They indicate that similar to physical and mental health, substance use health occurs across a continuum. CAPSA and P Ottawa Public Health have a visual illustration of this, which includes five points along a spectrum. So picture the spectrum. At the one end, we have no use of substances. Then beneficial use of substances with positive health or social effects. In the middle, lower risk with occasional use of substances that has negligible health or social effects. Towards the other end, we see problems occurring with substance use that has negative consequences for individuals, families, and or communities. And finally, we have substance use disorder, a, diagnostic, a diagnosable chronic medical condition based on 11 criteria listed in the Diagnostic and Stat Statistical Manual on Mental Disorders, the DSM-5. In that same document, CAPSA's document earlier, CAPSA makes the point that all kinds of people in Canada use all kinds of substances. For instance, in 2017, 78% of us, and I say us, 23.3 million people in Canada aged 
15 and over, reported alcohol use. In Canada in 2020, 6,000 people died due to opioids. 14,800 people died from alcohol-related illnesses, and 37,000 people died of smoking-related causes. Colleagues, most of the substances Canadians use are legal and regulated, including alcohol, tobacco, and now cannabis. CAPSA promotes a strength-based health promotion approach to substance use, with a spectrum of services along the spectrum of substance uses legal and illegal, which includes everyone, not just those with disorders. This is absolutely critical to reducing stigma. The bill we are currently debating at second reading, known as the Health-Centered Approach to Substance Use Act, is focused on illegal substances, and in particular, the opioid crisis my colleagues have so vividly described. Colleagues, criminalization, prohibition of substance use is not achieving the objectives of improved health and safety in our communities. According to Mark Thornton of Auburn University, alcohol prohibition in the U.S. was a failure, and I will quote him. National prohibition of alcohol, 1920 to 1933, the noble experiment, was undertaken to reduce crime and corruption, solve social problems, reduce the tax burden created by prisons and poor houses, improve health and hygiene. At the beginning of Prohibition, Reverend Billy Sunday stirred his audience with this prediction, and I quote, the reign of tears is over. The slums will soon be a memory. We will turn our prisons into factories and corn cribs. Men will walk upright now. Women will smile and children will laugh. Hell will be forever for rent. But although consumption of alcohol fell at the beginning of prohibition, it subsequently increased. Alcohol became more dangerous to consume. It was adulterated. Crime increased and became organized. The court and prison systems were stretched to the breaking point, and no measurable gains were made in productivity or reduced absenteeism. Prohibition, which failed to improve health and virtue in America, can afford some valuable lessons and provide perspectives on the current crisis in drug prohibition, a 75-year effort that is increasingly viewed as a failure. End of quote. Colleagues, in 1973, the Ladane Commission issued its final report on the inquiry into the non-medical use of drugs in Canada, recommending, among others, that medical treatment for individuals addicted to opioids be offered instead of criminal punishment. And colleagues, our recent reti recently retired colleague, the Honourable Larry Campbell, reminded us that his predecessor, BC Chief Coroner John Vincent Kane, recommended in a 1994 report on illicit, illicit narcotic overdose deaths that and I quote, the BC Ministry of the Attorney General enter into discussions with the federal ministers of justice and health on the propriety and feasibility of decriminalizing the possession and use of specified substances by people shown to be addicted to those substances. And today, almost 30 years later, we finally have a pilot exemption in BC, and the City of Toronto just last week has renewed its request for the same exemption. The 2011 report of the Global Commission on Drug Policy stated, and I quote, the global war on drugs has failed. Vast expenditures on criminalization and repressive measures directed at producers, traffickers, and consumers of illegal drugs have clearly failed to curtail supply or consumption. They recommend that to end, they recommend it, to end criminalization, marginalization, and stigmatization of people who use drugs but who do no harm to others, and to challenge rather than reinforce misconceptions about drug markets, drug use, and drug dependence. Colleagues, the 66th session of the United Nations Commission on Narcotic Drugs, the CND, was held in Vienna earlier this month. In his introductory remarks, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, Director General of the World Health Organization, said, and I quote Dr. Ghebreyesus, non-medical use of drugs leads to at least 600,000 deaths worldwide each year. 
largely due to viral hepatitis, HIV, and overdose. People who use drugs often suffer criminalization, stigma, and discrimination and are denied access to health services, further compounding the harms of drug use. UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, added at the CND, the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs, the so-called war on drugs paradigm is detrimental to public health. Fear of arrest and widespread stigma around drug use prevents people who use drugs from accessing health care, harm reduction services, and voluntary treatment services. Drug crime is one of the key reasons that well over 2 million people are in prison worldwide. If drugs destroy life, the same can also be true of drug policies. Representing Canada at the CND, Jennifer Sachs, Director General, Health Canada's Controlled Substances and Cannabis Branch, spoke about Canada's response to the drug toxicity overdose crisis, indicating Canada continues to advance drug policy that respects human rights. She stated that more needs to be done, but she did not mention decriminalization. Finally, and very importantly, in their brief to Canada's Minister of Health, leading up to the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, the Canadian Civil Society Working Group on UN Drug Policy said, and I will quote at length from them, I quote, the criminalization of drug possession has been ineffective in reducing drug use and has only perpetuated widespread human rights violations and discrimination towards marginalized groups such as indigenous peoples, racialized communities, women, people of diverse gender identities, and those with mental health conditions. One of the main drivers behind stigma and discrimination, criminalization, hinders people from seeking harm reduction and treatment services. Drug-related deaths continue to rise. Criminalization of drug possession also means resources are directed towards the criminal justice system instead of towards health and social services. In Canada, the push for decriminalization has been advocated for by civil society groups and professional organizations for many years. In 2021, the Federal Tax Force on Substance Use recommended the same. That same year, 2021, 112 human rights and public health organizations released a platform advocating for the decriminalization of all drugs for personal use and the removal of sanctions for related activities such as sharing or selling drugs to support personal drug use costs or provide a safer supply. Provincial, municipal, and law enforcement authorities have supported those calls. For effective decriminalization, a range of policies and practices that are evidence-based and tailored to the situation are needed. It's critical that administrative penalties such as fines, mandatory treatment for referrals, or drug confiscation are not substituted for criminal sanctions. Otherwise, this will allow law enforcement to continue monitoring and policing people who use drugs and will likely still disproportionately affect Indigenous, Black, and other marginalized communities." End of quote. Colleagues, as I move to conclude my remarks, I want to emphasize three important points. The first one, criminalization of people who use drugs does not work. I repeat what the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, said. If drugs destroy life, the same can be true of drug policies. Colleagues, I know we all want our policies to make life better and certainly not to cause more harm. Second, health is the common bond that Canadians can get behind. Seeing substance use health as part of our overall physical and mental health and making that health with both upstream and downstream considerations the focus is key to breaking free of this whole convoluted, stigmatizing, ineffective, expensive, and dangerous paradigm we are currently caught up in. And thirdly, in order to develop a successful national strategy based on a new health-focused paradigm, it is essential to have people with living and lived experience of drug use at the center of that process including Indigenous people and Canadians of African descent. Honourable colleagues, we are at an important societal crossroads. 
one where we have an opportunity to save lives while building a healthier and safer Canada for all. Honourable Senators, let's demonstrate the leadership of this chamber and move Bill S-232, Senator Boniface's important paradigm-shifting bill, to committee. Thank you. Wallalio, merci.